Hey, aloha no, kako. This is Kenson Kuba again, coming to you from the island of Maui in the Pacific. Well, I'd like to welcome you again to um, this study. We're going to continue on, our, on the Olivet Discourse, the prophecies that were given by Jesus. But before, before we do, I'd like to again welcome you to come to my uh, web website at BibleStudyCD.com. And there you can download free discipleship and Bible study materials to use for your own personal life, as well as to disciple others. You can even send them to people in other countries on the other side of the world if you want, because they are in PDF format. But the only thing I require is that you do not sell them or change them, because freely as you have received, freely give, but please make use of them, and let's win this world for our Lord Jesus Christ and make disciples of all nations. Okay, praise God. Let's go to our study. <clears throat> As you know, we're studying the Olivet Discourse as they are found in these three Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, and comparing them with a very similar passage from Revelation 6. We are not skipping around, we're just following the verses as they come and finding the great similarities between them, especially, well, of course, these three, but especially as they relate to Revelation, and we're going to see that even uh, today's study as well. So as we begin, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Let's uh, honor our Lord and humble ourselves before Him. Oh Lord, we just thank You so much. Thank You for Your Word and the truth of Your Word. Thank You, Father, for opening the window for us to, to look and glimpse the future, that we might see what is to come, what You have prepared for us, and even the warnings that You have for us, the signs that You have given to us, making us ready for Your coming. We praise you, Lord, because you are the living God, the one true God. There is no other. And we praise you because you have given us your Son, Jesus, to die for our sins, to live on our behalf and to die on our behalf, that his death will be our substitute for our sins. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your forgiveness, your new life that you've given to us. And now we pray that your Holy Spirit within us would fill us, fill our hearts and minds, open our eyes, that we might receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And uh, thank you, my friend, again, for stopping in your life and stopping and joining me in this study. And I pray that it's going to be profitable for you. Well, let's take a look. We're, we're going to continue on in Matthew 24. <clears throat> you can see by the uh, subheading that Jesus is bringing up this topic again of false Christ. He already mentioned it in the very beginning. In fact, the first sign he gave was that of false Christ. And so here he talks about it again. There, are, there will be false Christs and prophets. So let's read that in verse 23. He says, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe them. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. Okay, I'm going to stop in, in Matthew there. And as you can see, Luke doesn't have a um, comparable passage, a parallel passage. But Mark does, and so let's just look at that. And it's a similar passage, actually. It says, and then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or behold, he is there, do not believe him, for false Christ and false prophets will arise, and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. Okay. So it's a, almost a word-for-word -word similar um, uh, passage to the one that we find in Matthew. And in fact, I, I think you've... Uh, seen as I have, that Matthew and Mark are quite similar. And I would have thought Matthew and Luke would have been, but actually Matthew and Mark are the two very similar ones. So what is he saying here again? Again, he's warning us that there, is, there will come people who are claiming to be Christ or to be prophets of God, and they will not be. Um, in, in, uh, in fact, before the uh, destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., the period between Jesus' life and the destruction of the temple 
there were several of these people that came forth claiming to be the Christ and people would go out and they would follow them because some of them could do signs and wonders. Uh, in the book of Acts uh, chapter 8, <clears throat> we read about one of them and his name was Simon. And you might remember the story that in chapter 8 of Acts it tells how the persecution came upon the Christians in Jerusalem so that they were scattered and they went to different regions and areas in fact and even different uh, uh, they, they went out of the Israel and began to spread throughout um, Asia Minor but one of the pe persons that left was Philip he was the one of the deacons chosen to serve the uh, widows as you would read in the earlier chapters but he went, he went to um, Samaria and uh, there in Samaria he would preach the gospel and he did incredible uh, wonders, you know, he would cast out demons and he healed people of their diseases. And it says the people were quite amazed and they called him uh, the great one of God. But there was a man in Samaria already, his name was Simon and they called him Simon the sorcerer because he could also do signs and wonders. And so, you know, <laughs> the way the story is written, it's almost as if Simon got a little bit jealous that he would watch Philip and what he could do, and he began to follow him around. And in fact, the scripture says in Acts 8 that Simon ended up believing and being baptized uh, by Philip. And so uh, here's, here's uh, Simon, one of the groupies that he used to be one of these sorcerers, and he had a following himself, but he comes and he's, now he's following uh, Philip. So what happens is the Christians, the apostles who are still in Jerusalem, uh, heard about what was happening in Samaria and the work that Philip was doing. So they sent Peter and John to uh, verify this thing and uh, to make sure that everything was all right. And so Peter and John went to Samaria and there they met up with Philip and then they prayed for the believers who had come to faith and it says that when they prayed for them the Holy Spirit came and, and indwelt them and filled them. Apparently until Peter comes, and remember Peter was given the keys to the kingdom by Christ. And so what happens is Peter is the one that always comes and he opens the, the door in a way so that the Holy Spirit comes and confirms the salvation of the believers. And he's going to do it again with the Gentiles later on. But in Acts chapter 8, Simon, he, he, you know, his eyes must have got really big when he saw what Peter did. And so he, he comes to Peter and he says, you know, how, how much money how much money will it take for me to pay you so that you can give me this power so that I can call the Holy Spirit down and so that, uh, that the Holy Spirit can come into people. And Simon was just angry. And he uh, just denounced Simon for even thinking of that thing. And so, but I, I wanted to relay that story because Simon was one of these people right here, a false Christ or at least a false prophet who was able to do signs and wonders and as it says here so as to mislead if possible even the elect here in Mark he says uh, to lead astray if possible the elect now they seem to be both saying that uh, you know they that it could almost lead the elect astray but not not just enough you know, if possible, the elect. Now, the writers seem to be saying, well, it's really not possible because they are, they have been chosen by God and He's keeping them. But it, the signs and wonders were so great that even the elect were uh, tempted to uh, you know, leave the Lord and follow after these people. The point I'd like to make here is that there is a real emphasis in, in many parts of the modern church today where signs and wonders play a major part in their worship and their, their practice. And I'm not against signs and wonders. I, I, I believe in them. And I, when we were in Papua New Guinea, uh, there were um, many, many places, and um, especially missionaries, performing signs and wonders. There was one uh, missionary from Australia, actually, who was in the town of Madang. And I would go to his church and we would show the Jesus film and I would stay at his home. And he and his wife were uh, great, great believers. And they really encouraged me whenever I would go up there. But they, they told me that they were in a village once and um, the villagers showed them a child that had just died the day before. And he, had, he and his wife prayed over that child 
and they were able to bring that child back to life. So we're talking about, you know, major, major miracles. And so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say I don't believe that. I'm not gonna tell that person that. But these two were, this couple was uh, very, you know, great Christians and uh, friends of mine. And if they told me that's what happened, I believe it. So I believe in signs and wonders. But what I want to caution us is that there can be such an emphasis on this, where people hold these people with such reverence, the people that are able to perform these miracles. And we looked at that, at that before, before in Matthew chapter 7, where these people would come, when Jesus comes, they would say, Lord, Lord, didn't we you know, do miracles in your names and cast out demons in your names? And they would present that forward to the Lord as if that verified you know, their salvation. And the Lord turned to them and he says, you know, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity or lawlessness. And so signs and wonders has, has nothing to do with a person's salvation, really, even. That a person may be even to do these signs and wonders and not even be saved. So we need to be careful as believers that just because you see these signs and wonders, it doesn't mean that person is a genuine uh, prophet or even a Christian a Christian himself or herself. And we need to be very careful about that because the uh, fruit of a genuine Christian is, of course, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, a, a, a life of holiness, because the Holy Spirit will produce that. And this person you will discover to be humble and meek and gentle and uh, self-controlled and full of love and joy and peace. And you will be able to discern that in a person and that will determine whether that person is genuine and not a false person. Okay, and then I wanted to go on and say and read this part right here in verse 27. <clears throat> and in contrast to these people, uh, Jesus goes on in, in Matthew uh, 24. He says, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus is saying, you know, these people that come, and they will come and here in uh, Israel, they probably came out of the wilderness, or maybe they came from a, uh, another town. He says, they, they cannot be me, you know. They can't be the Christ. Because when I come, it will be as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west. That's, that's how you know. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, you know how when you see a lightning um, flash in the sky, it lights up the whole sky. You know, I mean, you're looking up and, and Jesus says, when I come, that's where you're going to be looking for me. You're going to be looking up in the sky for me. Remember when he ascended into heaven, he had his disciples with him. They were on the Mount of Olives. And then the, uh, the Lord himself began to ascend to heaven and the, all the disciples were looking at him as he left. And uh, eventually he disappeared into the clouds. And I guess they were all still looking up, you know, trying to see where he was. And then these angels came, and the angel says, why, do you, why are you guys looking up? You know, what are you looking up there for? He says, this same Jesus which was taken from you will return in like manner, in the very same way. So how do we know who the true Christ is, who the true returning Messiah is? You're going to see him. He's going to come in the clouds, even as the angel said, and even as Jesus said right here. And then Jesus goes on, and he says in verse 28, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. This is a very um, cryptic verse, and uh, the Bible scholars are, give all kinds of interpretations of this, you know. And uh, some people say, well, the corpse is Jerusalem, and that's where the uh, Jews gathered in Jerusalem. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to say my interpretation is the correct one, but I'm going to present to you my interpretation, and it is this, in that, the corpse represents Jesus, because okay? Jesus died. He really did die. How do we know he died? Because he was buried. And after he was buried, he was raised to life uh, by his Father, the God the Father. He is the corpse. This word vultures in the Greek can also mean eagles. Okay? It, it, it can be translated vultures, and they translated vultures here because in context it has to do with a corpse. And it would seem it would be the more fitting uh, word to choose. But you could also use the word eagles. Who are the eagles? 
I'm going to say the eagles are us, we who believe. But if you go to Isaiah 40, verse 31, it says, They who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They, they will mount up with wings as eagles. And so there is an uh, imagery there in Isaiah of people who wait upon the Lord, people who trust God, that they will be as eagles that will mount up with wings of eagles. And so this could be translated there, the eagles will gather. So what, what are we saying here? Well, Jesus says when he comes back, it's going to be like the lightning that's flashing from the east to the west. And it'll be in the sky. There will be a bright light in, in the clouds. And it will be, he will be the corpse, wherever the corpse is. And it's going to be in the clouds. The eagles, that's us. We're going to rise up on that day. And of course, we call it the rapture, even though that word, be careful, is not found in the scriptures. But we will be taken up together and gathered to him. This word uh, right here, gathered, whenever you talk about the rapture, you will see this word as well, that we will be gathered to him, as we're going to see later on in this uh, all of the discourse, not today, but later on. So I believe what this is referring to is the rapture of the church. When Jesus comes right here, you know, and, he, and he's going to be seen in the sky, just as lightning is in the sky, um, you're going to ask, well, why does he, they call him a corpse? It's because his body doesn't have uh, flesh and blood anymore. Uh, when he was here, he had flesh and blood, but his blood has all been um, kind of drained because his blood was drained for us. His blood was put upon the altar, and that was the blood that was given for our life. Uh, you've probably heard the scripture that the life of the life is in the blood. And so his blood is, he, he shed his blood. It's all gone. So when he appears in post-resurrection time in the Gospels, they say he came with, with uh, flesh and bone. His blood is gone. And so in fact, when he appears in the upper room, and Thomas is finally with the other disciples. Remember, uh, Jesus tells Thomas to bring your finger and, and touch my hands. Well, what's in his hands? It's the uh, nail print. And, uh, you know, normally uh, when you're alive, your body would heal and it would form a scar. You can just touch it with your hand. But the reason it says uh, Jesus tells Thomas to bring your finger is because he could poke his finger in the hole that was still there. Because his body was like a corpse. It was like the one you would find on a pathologist's um, table where he would do an autopsy. There is no healing going on in the body. All the injuries are still there as they happen. And so the nail prints were still there as holes in his hand. And actually, I believe it wasn't so much in his hand, but it was here. This is where they would put the nail in, right in the wrist between the radius and the ulna right here. They'd stick it in here. But uh, he says, put your fingers in there. And then more more uh, specific, he says, and, and bring your hand and thrust it into my side, is the way the scripture puts it. Thrust your hand in, into my side. And because the hole where the spear went in was still there. The word thrusted means in the Greek, insert it into my side. Now, if the body had healed itself, you wouldn't be able to insert your hand into, a, into the wound. It would have healed up. It would have been covered up with a scar. But Jesus says, no, insert it. Thrust it into my side because the hole was still there. Because he was basically a living corpse in a way. Uh, his body has showed all the signs of being pierced. And people could see that he was pierced. And that's going to come into play in our next lesson as we're going to see. Okay, let's move on. And uh, before we look at... <clears throat> the gospel passages and all of the discourse. I want to jump to Revelation chapter 6. And uh, here we have the opening of the sixth seal. It says, John is writing and he says, I looked when he broke the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. Okay? And there are other signs previous to that. Remember, there will be earthquakes in diverse places or various places. And we, I, we looked at that and we mentioned that the number of earthquakes were increasing. Well, I found a website, and I'm going to show it to you. And I'm going to give uh, reference to this person because he did some incredible things. And his name is Louis Vega, Luis Vega. And he, he I guess, works at the Sonoma State University. This is the uh, 
address of the website that you can go to if you want because he is an incredible uh, I'm not sure what gift he has but he's able to create charts and incredible I, I would call them almost works of art they're posters that he is allowing people to download for free and it took hours and hours I'm sure to make them because here here are some of them these are thumbnails of them and he's, he's created so many of them and I'm going to show you some of them and you can see the detail and the incredible work that he did and so you can go to his website and you can look at these things and uh, I'm going to warn you right now some of these things like this one here here is on the new age so they're not all Christian um, topics okay? some of these like this one right here on Planet X Nibiru, Nibiru is something that comes from a, a woman that says the aliens told her about this Planet X that's going to come very close to our planet and so but you know a lot of these are um, Bible oriented and yeah, even like politically oriented like the New World Order um, and I, you know they're just interesting things that uh, I'm going to use to illustrate uh, for you to see okay I'm going to bring up one of those posters because we were talking about the temple we talked about the destruction of the temple the last time and the abomination of desolation and that one was the second temple the one that Herod had built and where he basically uh, remodeled Zerubbabel's temple that Zerubbabel built after coming back from the exile in Babylon and that Herod's temple eventually was destroyed we, we studied that in the abomination of desolation when uh, Titus came with the Roman army and up, up on the Temple Mount we have now the gold the Dome of the Rock the Golden Dome um, Mosque and as well as here on this side we have the Al-Aqsa Mosque both of these were built in about the 6th or 7th uh, century AD many many centuries ago and uh, they're still standing here in Jerusalem but people are wondering, well, can you, is there room to build a temple here? And so here is this image of an artist's rendition of the temple right here. This isn't, this isn't part of the original photograph, don't get me wrong. This, this temple right here has been drawn in or painted in. But I wanted to show you that there is room for a temple on the Temple Mount even right now. And it was, it's important that the temple, as as the Temple of Sol uh, Solomon as well as um, Herod and Zerubbabel were, it is aligned towards the east, towards the Mount of Olives. And it has to be aligned to, to fit this gate right here. This is a gate. And this is called the Eastern Gate or the, or the Golden Gate. Because here, the uh, Messiah, they believe, will come through this gate when he returns and enter into the Temple complex. But here, as, as well, the Abomination of Desolation the Antichrist will come here and sit on the throne and proclaim himself to be God. So the question is, well, when will this temple be built? And the answer is, we don't know. I, I looked at a website and there uh, a, a rabbi from uh, the last century, I think maybe even from the 19th century, had prophesied that uh, it will not be rebuilt until a certain synagogue uh, was rebuilt three times. And well, lo and behold, it was rebuilt three times. It was destroyed in wars, and they would rebuild it. It was destroyed in another one. It was rebuilt, and it was destroyed again. And you know what? Finally, they have finally rebuilt it, I think, not too many years ago. And so it has been rebuilt three times. So we'll see if this rabbi's prophecy uh, comes true. Now that this synagogue has been rebuilt, it's a prominent synagogue in, in uh, Jerusalem, we'll see if it's, it's rebuilt. If it's if this temple right here is rebuilt uh, to fulfill his prophecy, but any in any case, you can see from these images that all of the uh, implements of the temple, the garments, the altar, the uh, table of showbread, the crown, the harps, and all of these utensils, even the menorah, have already been made, and they are already prepared to be put into the temple. You can see here a diagram of how the temple would be. You have here the Holy of Holies place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And then you have the veil which was torn when Jesus died because now the way to God is uh, open. The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God 
because God dwelt between the cherubim, even as he does now in his throne room, the cherubim surround him. But here the cherubim were on top of the Ark of the Covenant, as you probably saw in Indiana Jones, if you watched that movie. And God's presence, his Shekinah glory, was in between those two angels facing each other. Those two angels facing each other looked down into the box of the covenant. And because in the box were the Ten Commandments, the manna, the bread, as well as the uh, staff of Aaron, because it represented Israel's rebellion against God's law, God's provision, the manna, as well as God's leadership, Aaron's staff. And so these two angels are judging Israel, and in a way they're judging all of us. But once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies place, and he would have he would do that only after going through rigorous uh, ritual cleaning. Uh, and then he would finally go through here. They would put bells on the bottom of his robe, and they would listen for the bells to keep ringing to make sure that he's still alive. They would also tie a rope around his ankle so that in case the bells fell silent, they would know that God didn't accept him as a priest and struck him dead. So then now they could pull him out by the rope around his uh, ankle. But if he was acceptable to God, he would come into God's presence and he would sprinkle the blood of the bull that they would sacrifice on the altar on top of the cover of the Ark of the Covenant because that blood would cover the sins of Israel for another year. But as the book of Hebrews says, the blood of bulls can never take away their sins. And it took the uh, sacrifice of the Lamb of God to finally pay once and for all the sins for all of Israel and not only Israel, but all of mankind. And so there is no really need for this temple anymore that we can come into the presence of God as His children because for, for such we are. But if they build this temple, this would be the outline of the temple. You can see all these utensils here on the left as well. You can see this picture on the right. Now, let me raise it up. And uh, these are the two cornerstones that they're going to use. It's already been chiseled out. And behind my image, you can't see it, but behind here, they have a picture of a red heifer that they're going to sacrifice. And, uh, and the ashes of the red heifer will cleanse this temple. But anyway, I wanted to show you this picture as well as this other picture to show you how the temple will be situated. And here is an artist's rendition again. The temple is sitting next to the uh, Dome of the Rock. And as you can see, it's totally, completely aligned with the Eastern Gate where the Messiah can come through into the temple um, area. And you're saying, well, what, what are all these things right here? These are tombstones. This is a cemetery down here. Th this is a cemetery that the Muslims had created to prevent the Jewish Messiah from coming into this gate. In fact, they they blocked it off. As you can see, there's no gate there. Uh, it's all blocked off. But as if as if this would prevent Jesus from coming through there. I mean, Jesus can just speak the word, you know. Um, kind of like if you watch the movie Lord of the Rings, and Gandalf finally uh, gets the figures out the word to enter into the minds of Moriah. Uh, actually, Frodo figures it out and gives him the word. You know, uh, the word friend, save say friend, you know, and he says friend and this thing, the minds of Moriah gate open. Well, Jesus is just going to say, open. And it opens and he'll go go right in there, no problem. Okay? And so, uh, but I want to show you this picture to show you how it would probably look when it's, uh, when it's finally built over here. Okay, anyway, let's move, let's go on with that. Let's go back to our study. Okay. And so, and, and then I wanted to show you another thing besides that, besides the picture of the uh, thing. Another picture that um, Louis Vega has, has developed was earthquakes. I told you about earthquakes. I wanted to show you this this uh, poster that he made of the earthquakes. Okay, And uh, this these two charts, I wanted to show you these two charts, this one and this one. He charted out, uh, or he got this information from the uh, United States uh, what is USGS uh, Geographic Survey? Uh, he charted out earthquakes magnitude six to eight, so huge earthquakes. He he threw threw away the old, they, they threw away the uh, smaller ones, which are tons of them every day. But there's just these huge earthquakes. You can see from 
the beginning of the last century, 1900, you know, they basically stayed the same all the way up to around, up to the year 2000. You know, th these numbers haven't increased at all. But once you pass 2000, look what happens to the numbers of these huge earthquakes. It just, you know, skyrockets, you know, from 5 to 10 a year. Now, in the year uh, 2011, maybe 50. So, a tenfold increase. You can see the arrow as it, you know, just goes asymptotic in a way, or takes off. They call this a hockey stick, hockey stick uh, graph. Almost looks like the graph of the U.S. debt. But this one has is measuring uh, earthquakes. And remember, we talked about these signs as birth pangs. Well, you know, a, a woman in labor can have birth pangs, and they can be ten minutes apart for a long time. But as she comes closer to the time when she's going to give birth, the intensity of these earthquakes increase and the, the uh, frequency increases, just like this. And now forget the 6 to 8. We're seeing 9.0 earthquakes like this one right here that was in Japan in 2011. And here's a huge one that was also in Chile, 8.8. Uh, .8. There was a large 9.0 one in Haiti right here. And there were others even in other parts of the world. So we're beginning to see these huge earthquakes. And so you can see the, the frequencies of them have really in, increased. Now, what does that tell you about the time for the birth of the kingdom of heaven coming, of the Messiah's return? What does this chart say about that? You know, you know th this question mark right here on California, this person was uh, saying every 188 days, a big earthquake hits you know, somewhere in the uh, the rim of fire and sure enough it was it was happening 188 days 188 days but then when he went this way oh it didn't happen not in california you know why because this one right here they're waiting for a large one and people are, again are having uh dreams not just one or two but people many many people are saying they're dreaming and god is giving them dreams of this huge earthquake that's going to happen to california followed by one that's going to happen here again. It's going to be one in Japan and another one in California. And you're saying, well, Kenson, aren't you being kind of gullible? You believe in dreams? You know, I, I never used to believe in those things. I'll tell you the truth. I never used to believe in you know, signs and wonders and dreams before. But when I was in Papua New Guinea ministering there for six years, I was amazed how dreams, God could speak through dreams. And people gave me specific dreams of prophecy and they came through to the letter. I've never had one of those dreams myself, but people have had them there, and I, I believe in them because I've actually seen it come true. And the Bible says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit, and their young men will see visions, and their old men will dream dreams, and God will give dreams, and God will give visions to people, and they will, God it seems to be, uh, He says He's going to be giving people uh, premonitions, basically, of what is about to take place. And so people are having these dreams about huge earthquakes in California in uh, the Northwest, as well as the California coast that's going to cause incredible uh, tsunamis. I mean, you, you can go Google it and read it. Some of those descriptions are beyond, uh, almost beyond belief because it's going to create incredible destruction. And you see, it, it, it bothers me because I'm living right here on this little island in the middle of the Pacific, as I keep telling you before each study. And if we have this huge tidal wave from Japan, like we had with this one, we finally did have some wave action in Hawaii with that one. But it's this one, it's this big one right here that kind of uh, scares me. Because this big one might actually wash over my island. Now, maybe not completely over, but it will destroy a large part of Maui, of my island, and of Oahu, where I was raised, where Honolulu is, Kaneohe, which is my hometown, uh, it will cause a lot of damage. And uh, so I, I hope those dreams aren't true, but if they are, it's going to be incredible. And, uh, you know, God, God alone can help us after that. Uh, there are other dreams that we can go into, but we won't do that. But uh, here's another graph of volcanoes, as you can see. From the from the ni 1990s all the way to the year 2008, not too many volcanoes erupting. All of a sudden, in 2008, bang, 
up to the year 2011, which is how much this data shows, it's just a basically a five-fold increase in the number of volcanoes, in the uh, frequency of volcanoes. So the Lord is telling us something. The earth is telling us something. The earth itself is, is quaking and shaking, as the scripture says, and uh, travailing as if the earth itself is going to give birth, you know, to, uh, and it is, because it's going to go beyond the kingdom of the world. Now it's going to be the kingdom of heaven come down to the earth. And so and the earth itself is telling us that it is nigh, it is near, and to be, be ready because Christ is coming back. And so I wanted to show you this picture. Okay, now we go back to our study. We talked about earthquakes. And it says the sun became black as sackcloth and made of hair. And in fact, um, they would make, make it out of goat's hair. And you, could, you know, there, some of these goats are really black. And so they would make it out of, out of the yarn from these goat hair. And uh, the sackcloth would be really black. And then it says, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Okay, I'm going to stop there and, and then move to the Gospels because they say a similar thing. First Matthew, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, and the tribulation talking about the uh, abomination of desolation, and uh, we talked about the multi multiple fulfillment, not only in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple, but also even in some uh, future event that we cannot pinpoint yet, but a future event when the nations of the surrounding Israel will come against Jerusalem, as Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14 talk about, to try to destroy the city of Jerusalem. It says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, and again, we even talked about the tribulation of believers, and I, and I made mention to you that we will have to go through a tribulation and we need to prepare not just to live for our Lord, but even to die for Him. Uh, so I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I'd like to give you good news about this, but I need to give you the truth. Because God's Word is truth. You know, we cannot bend it to fit what we want it to say. We need to receive what it says. And, uh, you know, all this kind of thinking, what well, God is going to spare me from this tribulation. You know, brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters living in other countries are going through this tribulation even now. They're being executed. They're being persecuted. They're being beaten and imprisoned. Uh, they're going through it right now. It's just we who are in the West, and especially in America, we haven't experienced it yet. But as I showed you with some of the um, coming uh, changes in America, it is near and it is just about upon us. And we need to be prepared for that spiritually because we need to be prepared to suffer and to die for our Lord and not to give in to you know the Antichrist demands and, and Satan's temptations to give up our faith. We need to be prepared to stand and to say no, we're gonna be we're gonna be loyal to our Lord Jesus Christ. He says immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And so he's saying what Revelation 6 says, basically. Uh, this part right here, I thought maybe this referred to um, the satanic forces would be shaken, but when I compared the words to Ephesians chapter 6, you know, where Ephesians 6 says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers in the heavenly places, this word is different from that word as well as this word heaven is different from the word in Ephesians 6. So I don't want to draw the comparison. This most probably refers to the physical heavens and there's going to some, something's going to happen in our you know, solar system or something that is going to make people think that everything is coming loose and being shaken. Uh, we go to Mark's Gospel which says the same thing. But in those days after that tribulation the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. You know, I, I uh, worked for 20 years as a microbiologist with the water department, but my, my hobby was astronomy. I just loved it. I, I, I don't have it now, but I bought myself a 10-inch telescope, and uh, I love to go out into the backyard. Even I would take it up to the 
summit of Haleakala, which is the volcano that I'm sitting on. And in fact, you know, when you looked at those pictures and volcanoes were erupting, I live on a volcano. And Haleakala is not uh, extinct. It's, it's a dormant volcano. It erupted 200 years ago. It, it can erupt today, uh, you know, it, possibly. And so when these earthquakes happen, possibly there might be lava coming down the side of this volcano. Uh, Diamond Head, the volcano that you can see in Waikiki, is not extinct. It's dormant. And so that can erupt in Honolulu. If you saw the movie 2012, and uh, where they're they're trying to escape America and get to these ships in China, uh, they were hoping to land in Hawaii. And you remember the scene as they were flying in this large Russian aircraft, and the pilot says, "Oh, we finally we are coming to Hawaii," and they all come up to the cockpit to look down, and what do they see? They see volcanoes erupting, you know, and and Hawaii is just covered with volcano lava. Uh, burning Honolulu and Waikiki and the uh, Russian the billionaire guy says all he can say is not good not good and you know not good that's that's what I'm gonna say not good when the mountain that's in my backyard blows up and the volcano starts pouring down lava on my house but uh, I live on a volcano and so uh, I would I would drive up there with my 10 inch telescope and I would look at the stars at the summit 10,000 feet and there they have observatories up there as well. Uh, but uh, I would always read this passage when I was a Christian. And I would say, well, how, how can the sun turn off its light and become black? And how can the moon turn like blood? You know, how does that happen? Well, you know, we're, we're going to see, we're going to have an explanation of that uh, later on. But basically, it's the eclipse. When we were in Papua New Guinea, we saw a total eclipse of the sun. And it does turn black. You know, the moon comes and this, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about an annular solar eclipse. I'm talking about a full-on total eclipse. The moon turns black. And uh, so that explains how the sun can turn, be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. In a lunar eclipse, the moon goes into the Earth's shadow. And the shadow turns the moon a reddish tinge. And so they call it a blood moon. And so that's the explanation of that. Now this one I cannot explain. The stars will be falling from heaven. I'm not sure if he's talking about um, meteors, or just a lot of meteors, but this word stars is the Greek word asters, A-S-T-E-R-S, where we get our word asteroid. And you know, you know, they're always looking. In fact, on the summit of Haleakala, the Air Force has telescopes, and their main duty is to look for these asteroids that might create a collision with the Earth, so that we have, like, they, they had a movie, you know, Armageddon, as well as uh, another movie that they had made, talking about an asteroid hitting the Earth or a comet hitting the Earth. Well, they're looking for these comets and these asteroids. So perhaps he's talking about one of these, even as the book of Revelation says that there will be a star, wormwood, that's going to fall to the Earth and he's going to just destroy a third of the Earth. And so maybe that's what this is talking about as well. But uh, things, things are just going to be falling apart, literally, uh, on a grand biblical scale. Now I want us to finally uh, finish up with this, this uh, passage in Luke. He says, There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And that part he repeats what Matthew and Mark also say. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Everything is coming apart. Because, you know, not just earthquakes, but even when you look up in the sky, everything is like, what the heck is going on? You know, that's what people are going to be thinking. And there's going to be fear. And it says right here, and uh, people will be dismayed among the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. What is he talking about there? I believe he's talking about tsunamis. When you have an earthquake, it just shakes the earth and the ocean shakes. And it creates these shock waves through the water. And these shock waves create energy that when it comes up against a landmass, it creates huge, uh, not so much like waves like surfing waves, but tsunamis, tidal waves they call them. It's just a surge of water that can be, you know, six inches high 
up to hundreds of feet high and as some people are seeing in their dreams even a thousand feet high which I cannot imagine a wave that huge but that's what they're saying and if that's true it's going to go right over this island of Maui at least the middle part of our island and that would, that might be in reference to this great earthquake that's going to cause this uh, perplexity of roaring of the sea and the waves but I want us to uh, in fact well let me finish Revelation it says here who are these people that are perplexed and dismayed it's right here it says the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains and to the rocks fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath is come and who is able to stand this is the sixth seal that Jesus the Lamb of God opens and this is what these people say because when Christ comes back they're gonna look upon him and they're gonna see him and they this is what they're gonna say fall on us from the presence of him who sits on the throne because they're gonna realize oh man we're in trouble because the judge and the king has returned uh, you're gonna say well what are we gonna say well when this when this thing happens um, because Jesus has come in the air we're gone we're gonna be with him as we're gonna see in the next lesson we cover but these people are left behind and so they're going to run to the caves and they're going to try to hide in the caves and they want the caves to basically uh, cave in so that they can cover them from the wrath of the Lamb and, and the great day of wrath of talking about the wrath of him who sits on the throne who's that? God the Father and of course on the wrath of the Lamb and both of them are angry pouring out their wrath upon the earth for the great day of their wrath has finally come and who is able to stand and so this passage in uh, Revelation 6 uh, the, the uh, Christians, the believers are gone as we're going to see in the next passage but it heralds in and it ushers in the bowls and the uh, trumpets judgments uh, which, which are the wrath of God like I said the seals are not the wrath of God this is the wrath of God after this point the seals are judgments true but these are judgments against um, the Antichrist is judgments against sinners okay? and we will have to endure through it but this is the part that God is going to spare us because when you read the bowls and the trumpets my goodness man you know it makes these other ones that we covered just puny tiny things because when the trumpets are blown and the bowls are poured out upon the earth oh my goodness you know, talk about destruction and talk about deaths that is going to be deaths not in the millions but in the billions at that point okay? but here uh, finally we come to this part where it says there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and these signs and remember I told you when you're on the interstate and you're driving these signs will give you warnings they will give you directions they will give you instructions well God is going to give these to us you know we, Paul Revere when he looked across he looked across the uh, the, the water and uh, Charles River basically and he looked at the North Church and he saw the signal uh, the, the, his, his you know, partner in the North Church Tower gave him a signal well this is like a signal to us to show us when Jesus is coming back and God is going to give us a signal and he's going to give it to us by way of the sun and the moon and the stars let me uh, <laughs> let me go to another one of Luis Vega's um, charts and show you what that signal will be I know I'm going long and, uh, and you know I, I I hope you can just take a pause and you go do something else and come back to join me but uh, it, once I get going on this it's hard to stop it's, it's so incredible but uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about this Comet C slash 212 S1 you're saying well what is this thing you know, this uh, this Planet X Nibiru thing uh, he, has a, he has a poster on that but after I researched it I realized there was something that uh, is probably fictitious 
might be true, but it's probably fictitious because it's someone that says the alien told her about it, so I'm not taking that kind of thing too seriously. But this one is real. A comet is coming uh, next year. And you can read it down here. It says, um, let me raise this up so you can make sure you see it. It says, discovered on September 21st, 2012. It's the year that I'm making this study by astronomers in Belarus and Russia. And these are their names, Vitaly Nevsky and Artyom Novachanov. So these are the two astronomers. So eventually this comet is going to be called the nevsky Novachanov comet. Even as you've heard of hale bopp Comet, and you know, there's been other comets, always given the name of the people that discover it. Uh, and so this, it was announced on September 24th, 2012. Uh, it's, the comet is speculated to have never passed through our inner solar system before, but I, I researched it, and uh, one of the uh, websites that I went to said there was a comet in the 17th century that had a trajectory uh, quite similar to this comet. And they're saying it might be this comet uh, coming back. And in fact, that comet was so bright that it, uh, it could even be seen in the daytime. Well, let's look at what, what this comet is. And you can see here, this is a photograph of um, Israel at night, the uh, Golden Dome, the Dome of the Rock. And uh, here on this side is where I showed you before that the temple would be built. Here you see the Eastern and Golden Gate. Okay? The temple is not there right now, but uh, we may very well live to see that day when this temple is rebuilt. Everything is ready. They just need to have the will to do it. But let's get back to the comet. This is a uh, drawing of what the comet will appear like. It will be very bright, and uh, at this point in December of the year 2013, which is next year, it's the, the tail of the comet will be huge. It's going to cover 10% of the sky. They say it's going to cover uh, 70 degrees of the, uh, of the uh, sky. And you're saying, well, what's 70 degrees? How long is that? Well, you, it, I'm going to put this in the, in the camera so that you can see I'm holding out my fist at arm length. The size of my fist, if I stand here and I look at the horizon and I put the bottom of my fist on the horizon and then I can see it at arm's length, the distance from the bottom of my fist to the top is 10 degrees. Okay? Now I put that on another one, and now there's 20, 30, 40, and you go till you have 70, seven of those fists. And that's how long this tail is going to be. It's going to be an incredible sight. That's what they're predicting, because that's what happened to the comet in the 17th century. When that comet came, it was this beautiful comet, this huge tail. You'll be able to see it in the day. It's so bright. Even as you can see the uh, the moon, even though the sun is out, you can still see the moon, can't you? Well, the comet will be like that. So this might be uh, kind of like a picture of the, the stars falling from the sky. It's like a it's like a meteor in stop motion, you know, where you can see the trail of that meteor coming down. So that might be an image of the stars falling from the sky. And here you have the picture of, of the or the date when we're going to be able to see that. It's right here. Is that Comet C212S1 right now? It's going to appear in the latter part of the year two, two, uh, next year, 213. But what I wanted to bring your attention to as well is the lunar eclipses and the solar eclipses. First of all, the solar eclipses. You see right here, these are all the solar eclipses. There are two partial eclipses, these two. There are these that are annular eclipses. Annular e eclipses is when the moon is. Uh, very close to the Earth, so the Moon doesn't cover the disk of the Sun completely, and you have basically a ring around the darkened Moon. And then you have these total eclipses like these, where it's just a perfect fit, and the corona of the Sun, where the, you have the, uh, you know, the explosions are coming out from the Sun, where you'll be able to see those, and you have one here, and you have one here, and then you also have one that happened here. Then you have what what's this one is called is a next year, latter part of next year, you're going to have a hybrid uh, eclipse where it's going to be partial annular, partial total. It's going to be a combination of these two. And we're going to see that next year, right before uh, this um, comet is coming. And in fact, this day, November 28th, for America at least, uh, Canada is different. It's Thanksgiving Day for us. But uh, people will be go be able to go out on Thanksgiving night and look at the stars, and look at the comet in the sky. 
Okay. But there's going to be all of these solar eclipses. But I want to draw your attention especially to these lunar eclipses. That's what this moon is. This moon is blood red because it has gone into the shadow of the earth. The sun is directly opposite from the earth from the moon and our shadow comes upon the moon and it turns it this reddish color. Now what makes these so significant? Because we get lunar eclipses all the time. You have one a year, two a year, three a year. Uh, you have, or and then you can have a four in a row like this. You know, four in a row is called a tetrad, and there are a number of these through the years. But what makes these distinct is that these four fall upon the Jewish feast holiday, the Jewish feast Passover. This one is going to be on Sukkot which is the Feast of Tabernacles in the year 2014. And then they're going to do it again in 2015. Passover, a blood moon. Feast of Sukkot or Tabernacles, blood moon. In between these feasts, there are five other feasts. After the Passover, you got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, uh, the, the Day of Atonement, and then you, it closes out always, the Fall Feast closes out with this feast. So it's interesting that these lunar blood moons are bookends of all these feasts in between. Again, it repeats it. They're bookends of all these feasts in between. You're saying, well, what's the so significant about these you know, lunar eclipses? They fall on these um, four, you know, four eclipses in a row are going to fall, fall on four Jewish feasts. Well, the significance of this is, is right here. I'm going to show you. A pastor from Tacoma, Mark Biltz. Uh, I, I'm not sure how he did this or, you know, God led him to do it, I'm sure. But he had heard about the blood moons. And he just decided, well, let me check the records about the blood moons. And is there anything significant about them? And when they appear, because as we saw in the book of Luke, that God is going to give us signs. Jesus says these will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars falling. The stars falling could be this comet. It looks like a star falling from the sky. We saw this all going to be happening with great frequency in the next few years. But what Mark Biltz discovered was that he went to NASA website and there he could see when these lunar eclipses were going to take place. And what he did was unique. He charted this, the Jewish calendar, so that he could see uh, what they felt. He discovered that oftentimes, or at least eight times, since the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, eight times from that time till this year, 2015, there were four tetrads that fell on Jewish feasts in a row. Four lunar eclipses, four in a row falling on uh, Jewish feasts. Uh, he, he has them down here in the different years and then the uh, feast that it falls on, Passover, Tabernacles, Passover, Yom Kippur for the next three, and then the last four, uh, as, as we're going to see in 2014 and 15, they're going to fall on Passover and trumpets. Okay. Oh, I'm going to cancel that out. And what he discovered was, here are the first four he discovered. Okay. This was happening during Israel and during a time when it says right here they were being persecuted by the Romans. And they were of course scattered after the destruction of the temple. You have three very closely clustered tetrads. And in this period uh, the uh, Arabs, the Islamic people that were controlling, the Muslims were controlling Jerusalem at this time. It was about this time, right before here, that they built the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque actually. So you had the uh, Jews persecuted by the um, uh, the uh, Muslims. And then the next time you see these tetrads is right here. Okay. And uh, he, you know, th th these things right here are um, years that he's calculated. And when you calculate these years and you add them all up to the year 2018, they, they add up to 1948, which is the year that Israel uh, gained her independence. 
So I, this kind of number number thing, I'm not impressed with that because you can do all kinds of things with numbers. So that's I don't I'm not impressed with that. There might be something to it, but uh, it, I, I get skeptical about numbers kind of stuff. But this kind of thing where the moon, the lunar eclipses, that is quite amazing because this one right here, this tetrad, falls in 1493 to 94. And this is right after Spain uh, basically exiled all the Jews that were in Spain. Okay? Uh, at this point in Spain's life, they were having troubles with the Moors. So it was a battle between the Catholics and the Muslims. Okay? Now we come to these, these last three tetrads. This first one right here was in 1949 and 1950. And what's this really interesting is you can see these tetrads all relate to the nation of Israel. Here, when they were persecuted by the uh, Romans and as well as the uh, Muslims, here they're persecuted by the uh, Catholics, this one right here. In 1949 and 1950, this tetrad happens right after they become a nation again. Uh, the United Nations in 1947 uh, finally signed um, their document that formed Israel, but they didn't get gain their independence until 1948. And then they had to fight a war immediately after that against the nations that surrounded them and uh, to establish themselves as an independent state. And that's what this tetrad right here, number six, uh, dealt with. And then there is a, the, the, next, the next tetrad that appears is shortly right after that in 1967 and 1968. And I don't have to tell you that in 1967, they fought the Six-Day War where they gained um, possession of the entire city of Jerusalem. Now, the final one, at least within our lifetime, is going to be, is this one in 2014 and 15. And uh, it's, it's right ahead of us. Um, maybe, it's, maybe this is past the date when you're watching this video, so you would, at that point would have known what's happening here. But people are speculating about this that there is something that's going to be happening with Israel uh, in a couple of years as far as my, my vantage point. That either they will be at war or uh, you know something will, will be happening in the nation. Maybe the temple will be built or something about Israel right around this time, 2014 and 2015. The next tetrad in the future doesn't come for several centuries into the future. And so it will not be in our lifetime, nor the next, our children's lifetime, nor our grandchildren's lifetime, nor our great-grandchildren's lifetime. This, this is it as far as anything in the near, near future. And so here we are, right here in 2012, that's when I'm making this tape, and we are two years from this tetrad right here, this final one. And uh, it is going to be quite interesting to see what's going to happen here. And as I look at our world today, our world is in a, just at the brink of, you know, political collapse, as we saw nations against nations. It's at the brink of economic collapse, as the black horse uh, that is released with the rider carrying the scales and saying a quarter of wheat for a, a, a denarius or an entire day's wage. You know, we're at, we're, as I've shown you with the recent charts, we're at the collapse of our world, where earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis are happening at greater frequencies. We could see that. And then we, we saw that, uh, the, I think I showed you last time, that Israel is surrounded by nations that are very intent on destroying her. So we're close to the abomination of desolation. We're close to tribulation for the saints as well. Uh, in fact, we, it is happening even now among many of our brothers and sisters. And I believe it will befall us who are in uh, America, in the Western countries as well, as um, we see the, that collapse around us. And it, we're, we're, we're like at the uh, precipice. Some people say we're not even at the precipice. We've already gone off the cliff. <laughs> and, and we're actually falling in midair already. That this whole thing is falling around us. And so I showed you uh, the eclipses, the lunar, the solar, the uh, comet that is coming in fulfillment, it seems, of uh, these passages right here. And then the next event that's going to happen, as we're going to see in our next lesson, is Jesus coming right after this thing. And these are pointing to the coming 
of Christ because right here is foretelling that the wrath is about to be poured out through the trumpets and the bow judgments. Well, we've covered a lot in this lesson. I know I've taken a lot of time and I, I hope you stuck by me. But you can see that um, those of us who are alive today are seeing these things come to pass. I know there are many who believe that these are things that uh, were completed and fulfilled by 70 AD. But, uh, you know, that might have worked until Israel became a nation and until Jerusalem was taken again. And you know what scares me is that when you look at these prophecies and people are having these dreams and it's all pointing to the same time. And I don't have to talk about the Mayan calendar. I don't, you know, I'm not sure what that's all about in terms of a destruction of the world. It's more about a change in, in, uh, in, in um, kind of like the different kingdoms changing from one to the next. And there's going to be a new age coming. And uh, I remember when I was in college, we, we would sing about the, the, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And they said it's going to be in the next century. Well, here we are in the next century. And you can call it what you will, but I know what it is, is the coming of the kingdom of heaven to earth because the king is coming and he's returning. I'm going to show you one last thing. And again, you know, you, you're saying, well, Kenson, you're going kind of out on a limb. You know, do, do you really believe these things? Well, I know God speaks in so many different ways. This right here is a prophecy. And at first I thought it was a scam. So I researched it. And I tried to make sure that this was a genuine article. I don't want to teach something to you that I know is fake and somebody made up, you know, just to have make fun of us. But this one is true. That there was a rabbi in Germany, and some, some say maybe it was more in Poland, but they're right next to each other. The rabbi's name was Judah Ben Samuel. And uh, he was a very um, uh, godly uh, rabbi. He was mystical. as That's the word that they would use for him. Uh, some people said that they observed him. Witnesses said when he uh, conducted the Seder Supper that the prophet Elijah himself was a participant in that Seder Supper. And in fact, they saw the prophet with the rabbi in the synagogue as well. So perhaps the prophet Elijah, you know, Elijah came when Jesus was here and he was with him in the Mount of Transfiguration. I believe he's coming again. And perhaps he came to give this rabbi this prophecy to prepare us. But if anybody would know, it would be Elijah. because he, he is a true prophet and he would speak to this rabbi. Well, be, right before this rabbi died in the year 20, or 1217, many, many centuries ago, right before he died, he gave a prophecy. And his prophecy is the prophecy of the Ten Jubilees. He said that God showed him that there would be ten jubilees and then uh, the Messianic Kingdom would come to earth. And a Jubilee, and there, there's a difference of opinion on a Jubilee. But some people say it's 49 years, which is seven, seven sevens. Excuse me, I, I keep getting these interruptions. Uh, this, my neighbor girl, 10 year old girl keeps coming. And so I, I enjoy talking to her. So she just comes to talk to me. So that's why I keep leaving and I keep coming back. But anyway, let's get back to our study. Um, so this rabbi, Judah ben Samuel, is prophesying that he said God told him that there would be ten jubilees. Uh, again, like I said, there's a, there's a differing opinion about what a jubilee is. Some people believe it's 49 years, which is uh, seven seven-year periods. That equals 49. And they believe that the uh, last year of the seventh um, you know, group of sevens represents the jubilee year, and then it starts with the first of the next seven, uh, so which, which would be just 49 years each jubilee period. And then there are those who believe it's a 50-year period. After you have the seven, seven years, which is 49 years, the 50th year is a jubilee. And after that, you begin the uh, next group of 49 years. So each jubilee period is 50 years. Well, you know, I believe it's a 50-year period because if this prophecy is, is true, then this one is based on the 50-year jubilee. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me that you would have a jubilee period that's part of a, a part of a group of sevens already. That you would, the jubilee year would be a year by itself. It's kind of like um, you know when, when you have the the uh, week, you have six days, and then the seventh day is the Sabbath. Okay? 
And uh, if you call the Sabbath um, the first day of the next week, and then the next week, is, you're already shorting the next week. So the Sabbath, there is one Sabbath in every group of sevens. And so in every group of seven sevens, you would have a, a jubilee year after that. And then you'd have a separate group of seven sevens. But anyway, th his prophecy of 10 jubilees has to do with 10, 50-year periods. And what his prophecy said was he didn't know the dates. He didn't give any dates. But what he said was that Jerusalem would be ruled by the Turks for 400 years or eight jubilees. That's what he said. It would be under the control of the Turks for eight jubilees. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then in the ninth jubilee, uh, there would be no man's land. The Jerusalem would be no man's land. So right here. And then in the tenth, tenth jubilee, it would come back under Israel's control which is really interesting because even as he gave that prophecy in 1217, uh, there was no Israel at that time. It was Palestine. And the Jews were all scattered throughout the world. So he was actually prophesying that Israel would come back to the land and control the city of Jerusalem again. So what happened in history? Well, 300 years after he died, he died in 1217. He gave the prophecy in that year that he died. This is 300 years after he died, the Ottoman Turks took control of Jerusalem. Okay? And so from 1517, they were in control until in World War I, the British General George Allenby came and he walked into uh, Jerusalem on the Feast of Hanukkah. And actually they say he walked in there without a shot being fired because the Ottoman Turks had uh, abandoned the city. And he took control of the city. So how many years is this? In incredibly, it's exactly 400 years. It's exactly eight jubilees, even as Rabbi Judah ben Samuel said. And then from 1917, uh, Jerusalem, and in fact the area of uh, Palestine, was under a British mandate. Not just Palestine, but even a greater area, including the Jordan. So it was under British mandate. So from 1917 until the time when Israel took control of the entire city of Jerusalem again, uh, it was under... Uh, British mandate as well as Jordanian control. But there was a area in Jerusalem right down the middle that was called no man's land because you had the Jordanians on one side and then you had the Israelis on the western side. And in between was a buffer zone. They called it no man's land that you know you couldn't go there. I think you'd be shot if you went into that area. And so incredibly the name was no man's land, even as the rabbi had said in this 50-year period. From 1967 to 2017 will be the 10th Jubilee period and it is under now Israel's control even as the rabbi said it would be. So here, uh, what, I, what I like about this prophecy is that anybody can say, well in 2018 or 2024 this is a, such and such will happen. How do we know if his prophecy is credible. Well, what they, would, what they would do in the New Testament time to find out if a prophet spoke presumptuously or if he was a true prophet was they would make him give a short-term prophecy so that they could see if he could foretell a short-term short event that they could verify and then his long-term events could be considered um, uh, true or credible. When I worked in the laboratory, we're always looking for the unknown in, in, in our test for chemistry, chemical uh, contaminants. How do we know when we find an unknown and how can we trust that the amount of, what, of our discovery is true? Well, the way we discover that and the way we determine whether the instrument is working correctly, whether our methodology is correct, whether our re reagents are working properly or if they're expired and no good, is that we would run these uh, controlled samples, we call them. These are samples where we know what the results should be. And they're already pre-made. And so we would run these controlled samples in various ways. So that when we finally came to the unknown sample, which we took from the, uh, the water distribution system or from the uh, reservoirs, when they gave the result, we could see whether our methods, our reagents, our instruments were working properly. Because they would have to give us the correct answer on the known substance 
the known controls, and if they did within a certain parameter, usually within 10% of the known amount, then we could trust that the unknown amount was correct to within 10%. Same thing with prophecy. How can I know whether his prophecy that the Messianic era is going to start after 2017 is true? Well, what he does is he gives, he gives us intermediate or short-term prophecies. And if these don't come true, then forget about this long one. You know, If you cannot even foretell these short ones, then we have no faith in this long one. Here's a scary thing about what he said. This came true. This one came true. And this one came true. Or it, or it is the process of becoming true because Israel is in control. Now, these are like the control samples that I run in my chemistry lab. These, these samples came out not just within 10%, but 100% recovery. And that tells me that his long-term prophecy of the Messianic age starting at, in the year 2017, with all probability, in all probability, will be 100% fulfilled. What does that mean to us today? This is 2012. This is telling me that I have five more years. If this, if this rabbi's prophecy is true, I have five more years before Christ comes back. That isn't much, much time, you know. I've been telling people uh, for years now around me that Jesus is coming soon, and they think I'm crazy, you know. I said we need to get ready. You need to get ready spiritually. They think I'm crazy, but this prophecy right here that God is revealing to us right now is is it's like God telling us he's coming he's coming now um, I would tell my wife you know that Jesus is coming soon I just sense it I believe it and then she would go you know to church and then the, our pastor's wife who actually is a uh, Jew, Jew, Jew from uh, Iran her family escaped she's actually Persian she speaks Farsi but she would always say no he's not coming soon he's not coming soon she would tell my wife and then she's just recently she told my wife, you know, I I had a dream and the Lord told me he is coming very soon. And so she told me, she told my wife, tell your husband that he's he's right, that Jesus is coming very soon. And I, she's not the only one having these um, premonitions or these dreams, but others are as well. Uh, you know, this date right here is the most firm date I can see. There are other people, and uh, let me. Let me throw up this chart again. Let's see, where is it? Yeah. Let's get a closer, let's, let's get a chart with a closer view. And it's this one. Let me bring this thing up. This year of Jubilee, right here, and by the way, the blue, the blue line right here is the different years in the Gregorian calendar. So we are right here in the year 2012, right in September when I'm making, or October, I'm making this study tape. Okay? Uh, we're we're going to be having a total eclipse soon right here, I can see. In the year 2013, I tell you the uh, comet is coming. And then in 14 and 15, we're going to have a series of lunar and solar eclipses. Well... This year right here, the Jubilee year, I tell you, is the 50th year. And many people believe Jesus is coming in a Jubilee year. Okay? In a Jubilee year. Because when he first came uh, 2,000 years ago, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, sight to the blind, to encourage those who are mourning, and to proclaim the favorable year of our Lord. The favorable year of our Lord many believe and most people believe is the Jubilee year. Okay? And so he's proclaiming that his he is his period for as Savior will will extend all the way into the Jubilee year. This is a period of grace when people are free to hear the gospel and respond to it and come to him. When he when he gave that quote which is from the book of Isaiah, he, he stopped at the verb before the ending it. And he stopped before ending it. He, he rolled the scroll back up and he gave it back to the person and he sat down. This is what the gospel tells us. He left out the last part because after he says to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the next very next line would have been, 
and the day of vengeance of our God. The day of vengeance is what we saw uh, in the book of Revelation 6 when people said the day of wrath is come because they could see the one sitting on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb you know, is, is they're going to pour out their wrath upon the earth. And that starts right after this Jubilee year. And so he's going to come in a Jubilee year and right after he, at that moment that he comes, he gathers his saints and then begins the wrath of God and the judgments of God, ushering in his kingdom. He's going to clean house, basically. He's going to get rid of sin and sinners. And at that point, he's not savior anymore. He's judge, jury, and king. And if you don't know Christ at that point, you're out of luck. The, the, the uh, deadline has passed. The door has shut. You're on the outside. And now judgment is coming. And there is no hope, absolutely, for people who have not come through the door, from through the way that Jesus is. No hope at that point, And vengeance is all they will see from him, the wrath of God. And that will start here. Now, Rabbi uh, Judah ben Solomon, Samuel, says it's going to be more like here. And so I've seen different you know, calculations that says, yes, the Jubilee year is further back here, not in 2016, but it will be here instead. And so that would fit in with his with his prophecy. Prophecy. In any case, we're going to see these heavenly signs. We're going to see the star falling from the sky. And maybe there will be others as well. And all of these signs are happening right now, all pointing to the time when Jesus returns in the Jubilee year, and he's going to gather us to himself, and that's going to be the topic of the next lesson. And so we're going to keep it at that. So let's pray. Oh, thank you, Lord, so much for, so much for showing us the signs. I pray, Lord, my friend and I will be ready and prepare ourselves spiritually for that day. We will prepare ourselves spiritually to live for you and to die for you, if that be your will. And we give to you our lives. Glorify yourself through us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sorry to go so long this time. I pray it's been a blessing for you. And uh, we'll see you in the next lesson. Please join me. Aloha no, malama pono. God bless you.